the next speaker, uh, Dr. N. Venkatesh Prajna, who's done a, a huge amount of work on fungal keratitis. He's the chief of uh, cornea and refractive surgery services, director residency training program at Arvind Eye Care System. And uh, currently he's at Arvind Eye Hospital, uh, Madurai. He's going to be talking about fungal keratitis, uh, present and future. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Namrata. Uh, in the next 10 minutes, I'll be just sharing some of uh, the information uh, which we as an institution uh, are currently performing uh, in the field of fungal keratitis. So we all know, actually, larger ulcers can heal. We don't know how and why, but we just know that larger ulcers can heal with medication. We also have come across that smaller ulcers might not heal and might eventually perforate or require a therapeutic keratoplasty. Usually we blame patient compliance alone, but over the period of years, we've come to realize that a complex system of interactions, especially associated with the organism virulence and the human immune response may play a role. So our whole treatment and diagnostic strategy has been to see whether we can actually predict the treatment outcome in the field of fungal keratitis. In today's topic, I'll be concentrating two of my current works, the artificial intelligence work, where we are doing with the University of Michigan, where we plan uh, to develop a system which can prognosticate a corneal ulcer. And the second project, which I'm currently embarking on with uh, University of Edinburgh is to look at uh, developing smart probes, which would aim in diagnosing and aiding in precise treatment. The first, the AI part, mainly on the prognostication of corneal ulcers. This is actually an NIH sponsored R01 project involving three institutions, uh, Aravin, Kellogg, uh, as well as Duke. Basically, what we want to see is whether in clinical practice, if I see a patient on day one, and if the patient comes for a follow-up on day three or day four, my assistant or my colleague sees it, he usually does not know what I have seen. And based on the signs and the presumed symptoms, they come to a conclusion whether the ulcer is healing or not. So our plan is to develop a quantitative artificial intelligence demonstrative project or a product which would actually give a value, something like a CSR, something like a macular edema value, which an OCT gives uh, in for CSR or a diabetic macular edema. And then we know objectively that the patient is healing, the ulcer is healing. So this has been going on for almost three years. In 2018, we published uh, in Cornea where we just said that photography and computerized methods are better than ophthalmologists when we just measure the size of corneal ulcers. That was our first uh, demonstration where we said uh, a, a, a documented photography and a computerized method for measuring that photography would be much better than just the eye doctors uh, measuring the size of the ulcers. We followed it up two years later, where we developed uh, in collaboration with Duke Institute. Uh, uh, we, we developed algorithms, uh, again, with Dr. Sina Farsiu, who has done a lot of work in spectralis OCT. Uh, we developed good collaboration. We've now developed image analysis algorithms, which actually meant that we had to use that artificial intelligence system to understand what an epithelial defect is, to understand what a stromal infiltration is, and to also make that instrument forget the light reflex, which can also reflect in a whitish manner. So that was uh, taking some time, but over a period of time, we've developed a fairly good algorithm, which at this point of time we presented, uh, we published it this year, where we say 
that it holds a lot of promise for quantification of corneal physiology and pathology, something like uh, the OCT measurement of macular edema. So with regard to artificial intelligence, we believe uh, that a well-developed artificial intelligence system can be a good source to possibly say whether this uh, ulcer is caused by uh, fungi or bacteria. And not only that, over a period of time, uh, if we actually employ this technique over second day, third day, fourth day, we are able to predict whether the ulcer is healing or not. And then from this knowledge, possibly we can develop an algorithm which can tell us at the time of presentation that this ulcer is more likely to progress and hence would require a much more aggressive treatment uh, than a, a regular ulcer. So that's the whole idea. We want to develop an instrument which will prognosticate uh, a corneal ulcer, especially fungal corneal ulcer. So that was the first project. The second project uh, was uh, trying to see uh, whether uh, the technology of smart probes, it involves a lot of chemistry, uh, whether that can diagnose and also aid in the precise treatment. This is in collaboration with the University of Edinburgh, Liverpool, and University of Bath. And very interestingly, this was not a this is not a collaboration with ophthalmologists, but it's a collaboration with pulmonologists uh, because pulmonologists also, uh, you know, have a lot of uh, experience working with fungus. Uh, so based on uh, their experience of diagnosing and treating uh, the fungal infections of the lung. We are now collaborating it and trying to replicate the same in the eye. So this is a team which combines uh, chemists, physicists, engineers, signal processors, and machine learners, as well as clinicians. And this was initially employed out by our collaborators uh, in the ICU at Edinburgh, where they could find out uh, by just injecting these smart probes, these chemical probes, uh, into the lungs in vivo, and then trying to identify whether they're dealing with just an edema or they're dealing with an infecting organism or whether uh, they're just dealing with a case of alveolar collapse. So based on this experience, what we did was we used the similar uh, smart probes in the field of cornea. And uh, we looked at uh, the corneal scrapings and then compared it with just our regular gram stain and potassium hydroxide, uh, we used uh, the chemical probe called the BAC2. We also used BAC1. But to give a long story short, what we say is the fluorescent smart probes, they offer a comparative methods to gram stain to know whether it is gram positive or gram negative bacteria. And now we've also identified some good fluorescent smart probes for fungus. Our idea is to use this technology in the field, in the vision centers. Uh, we are starting to develop some fluorescent microscopes, uh, a simple fluorescent microscope for less than 100 rupees, which can be employed in the field. If it sparkles blue, it's probably a gram positive. If it sparkles red, it's probably a gram negative. If it sparkles green, it's probably a fungus. So that's the whole idea. The story doesn't stop there. What our uh, co-investigators have also found out in the lung is not only do these smart probes detect the organism, it can also detect immune response. So there may be uh, smart probes which can actually target uh, and also tell us whether there is an increased activity of MMPs or human neutrophil elastases or cathepsins. And interestingly, using this technology, our investigators have actually applied a topical MMP inhibitor directly towards the lung, which actually suppresses MMP activity in the lung. So our idea is using these probes to actually diagnose the etiology, but also actually not only the etiology, but also diagnose any increased immune activity but also finally, and more importantly, take the drug directly to the point where the drug is required, where it has to kill the fungus, it would do so, and where it would have to decrease the MMP activity 
with different uh, drug, it would it would uh, do so. So that is the whole purpose of uh, this future related activity. So this slide was used by me 10 years ago, and I think it's slowly becoming a reality. And what I say is, at least in the future, if, a, if I get a fungal keratitis, I would be treated with natamycin P, where P will be for prajna, it would be uh, something, a small molecule tagged on along with natamycin, which would selectively cause a local topical uh, immunosuppression. And if somebody else gets a, a, a fungal ulcer, uh, they would be treated differently and not like how we are uh, treated now. And I, I, I foresee the generation 30 years or 40 years from now uh, getting very surprised that all patients with fungal ulcers were being treated with one drug. Uh, something like penicillin, which was being used as a wonder drug at one point of time. So in essence, at this point of time, our treatment of fungal keratitis is killing the fungus and thinking that we have conquered the disease. But in the future, it is not going to be enough. It is going to be the interface and the whole treatment armamentorium is going to be concentrated on the interface, on the activity between the fungus and the host, which is going to actually determine who is going to heal and who is not. So we have shown in many publications that there is considerable variation existing between the fungi, even amongst the same species. You take 100 Fusarium solani, you have different pigmentation even amongst this 100 Fusarium solani. So not all fungi, have same virulence, even if we are talking of the same species. And there is a differing host response to different fungi. And we have showed in our lab uh, for Aspergillus and Fusarium, there is a differential expression of a zinc alpha glycoprotein in the tears, wherein for, fun for Fusarium, it is a differing response and for an Aspergillus, it's a differing response. Killing the agent does not necessarily mean controlling the disease and the future is I would have been ridiculed if I had spoken about using immunosuppression for fungal keratitis 10 years before, but COVID has given a lot of respectability to the use of immunosuppression. People are more scared of the cytokine storm rather than the COVID itself. So I personally think the topical selective, and that's the word selective immunosuppression is going to be the way we are going to treat this disease in the future. Thank you very much.